Welcome back to New Rockstars. It's me, MT, and this is a breakdown for Sony Pictures Morbius. So let's go ahead and take a bite into all the fun, missable details and Spider-Man Easter eggs that the MTU's neighbor universe has to offer in this dark new chapter filled with blood. Ah, ah. Ah, sorry, I just watched too much Sesame Street as a child. Very upset that the Count did not show up in the post credit scene, by the way. What were you thinking, Sony? Come on. And also, spoilers for the whole blood-sucking, life-sucking affair that is Morbius. But hey, if you clicked on the video that said Morbius Breakdown, then I'm sure this spoiler warning isn't needed. And the director spoiled the movie himself. <laughs> So let's go ahead and sink our suckers into the secrets of Scared Lato, shall we? And right off the bat, the movie opens up with blue and pink V-shaped designs preceding the title of the film, Morbius, evoking the colors and font of the Mobius solo series from the 90s, which I found to be a very smart and nice design touch, with the V-shaped downwards arrows representing the famous V-shaped design of Morbius's collar, a collar that many of Morbius's victims have gotten up close and personal with, you know, right before they died because their heads would have to rest on that big old red collar. Well, either died or became a vampire, which is something that was incorporated into the power set of Michael Morbius in Marvel Team-Up number three and four from back in the day. Like he didn't originally have the power to turn other people into vampires because he himself was a living vampire rather than an undead vampire. And this is a power that is of course alluded to at the very end of the movie with Martine Bancroft's resurrection post Scared Leto Nibble, with Martine's vampiric turn being something that happens in the comics as well. And she actually ends up becoming an enemy to Michael Morbius, with her goal being to turn Michael into a true undead vampire like her, because as we see in the movie, she died and came back to life, whereas Michael never died. But anyways, the first shot of the movie finds us over the jungles of Cerro de la Muerte, Costa Rica, with Cerro de la Muerte actually translating to the Hill of Death, which is symbolically fitting considering how much death these bats hiding in these mountainous hills are about to inadvertently Cause. And when Morbius hops out of this N9747P labeled helicopter, a set of characters often seen together on vehicles in movies with this helicopter and cars, he consoles a group of Costa Ricans scared of the dark by telling them that nocturnal vampire bats can down a creature 10 times their size while the film shows the remains of an unfortunate animal at the mouth of this cave. But hey, fun fact, even though Morbius himself sucks blood, vampire bats don't actually do that. They actually lick the blood off of their victims after making small, numbed cuts. On them. So the fact that this creature is nothing but bones here very much justifies the fear of Morbius's Costa Rican bat trapping helpers because that seems like one very painful way to go. And though it may seem like vampires get their name from vampire bats, it's actually the opposite, with vampire bats being named after the fictional vampires after 1987's Dracula became so damn popular amongst the ancestors of future Edward Cullen stands. People couldn't get enough of that Dracula. But moving on, the movie then cuts to a flashback 25 years in the past, with a sick Morbius playing chess by himself before meeting a boy named Lucian, with this lonely game of chess sort of symbolizing how Morbius has to dedicate his life battling himself and the mysteries of his broken genetic code. But then Michael would then of course naturally go on to call Lucian the name of a dead child named Milo who died a long time ago for the rest of Lucian's life like a normal person as the two somehow remain best friends despite this constant weird morbid bullying. With Milo being the best friend figure the character Emil Nikos was for Morbius in the comics who also eventually gets turned into a vampire who wants to kill Morbius just like Martine Bancroft. Kinda bad to be friends with Morbius. Also, since I'm a big old weirdo, I also found that if you unscramble the letters of the name Emil Nikos, you can actually get the term Milo's Kind, which can translate to no Milo's in German, which I thought was very funny considering that all the Milo's who weren't actually Milo's in this film with, you know, the, the Lucian thing. But of course, in this live action adaptation, the name Emil Nichols would ultimately be given to Jared Harris's character, the man who would introduce Morbius to his new best friend instead of actually being his best friend in the live action universe. And Mr. Emil will go on to make everybody in the audience perk their ears and raise their eyebrows when he mentions a school for gifted children in New York, a huge allusion towards Professor Xavier's school for gifted youngsters that houses the mutants of the X-Men, which is a wildly bold move for Sony. As far as we know, they have zero rights to any of the X-Men properties, considering that Sony did not buy the rights to the X-Men for several billion human dollars a couple of years ago. And after the two young boys are inexplicably targeted by bullies for having a sickness beyond their control, Morbius quotes the mantra of the famed Spartan warrior king Leonidas, expertly played by Gerard Butler in the movie 300, where the few 
battle the many, which is a phrase that Milo and Morbius share in the film. We then flash forward to the present day to a scene of Morbius being awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on creating blue artificial blood cells that Emil notes as being responsible for saving more lives than penicillin, which is a huge deal considering that penicillin has been regarded as one of the greatest medical advancements in human history as it was literally the beginning of human antibiotics. And an achievement that comic book Morbius succeeds with as well. But unlike his comic book counterpart, Scarletto rejects the Nobel Prize because while saving all these lives were great, his main goal was to cure his disease for the far fewer people around the world who were also afflicted because his disease really sucks, so he felt like a failure. And hey, unless you have the genetically augmented strength and endurance of Morbius, you probably need a little pick-me-up now and then. But no need to retreat to your science lab to find the perfect energizing formula. Instead, you can just reach for the new G Fuel Plasma Collector's box. Look at this. Ooh, now Morbius themed. Inspired by Sony Pictures Morbius, it comes with a Morbius shaker cup and a tub of the custom flavor plasma. It's not real plasma, like blood, it's just, it's called, it's called plasma. Let's mix it up, shall we? a great nectarine flavor and it's so fitting that it's such a sunshiny fruit flavor for a character that can literally walk on sunshine through the air and it's got antioxidants and a focus complex to help you stay on your a-game whether you're trying to cure yourself of a disease or just trying to finish elden ring and g fuels even better when you want to go back to watch morbius again in the theater so you can find all those missable details and when you do just make sure you have a shaker full of plasma so you can have all the focus to notice every single thing that i missed in my breakdown so use the link in the description or use the code new rockstar 30 to get 30% off the collector's box. And thanks to G Fuel for sponsoring this video. Get yourself a Mobius cup today. But the most interesting thing of note here is this Daily Bugle newspaper article underneath all that boring Nobel Peace Prize stuff that notes that it has been apparently 90 days since the last sighting of a superhero in this Venom universe. Subtly implying the existence of Spider-Man in this universe without saying the term Spider-Man. You know, despite all the Spider-Man references in the Morbius promo material that was scrubbed from the final product. But considering what we know from the end of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, that Peter Parker stopped being Spider-Man for a period of five months or 152 days, we could be looking at a scenario where Morbius takes place during that five month gap between July 2014 and January 2015, when Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man was crying over spilt Stacy's. I mean, Oscorp did have a file on Michael Morbius after all, alongside Dr. Kurt Carr aka the lizard another scientist obsessed with splicing human and animal dna and was actually a very big part of morbius's origin comic because morbius's blood was actually some type of healing agent for lizard at the time and with morbius having been confirmed to be part of venom's universe it also makes sense for them to share andrew garfield's spider-man universe as the amazing spider-man 2 does show us that oscorp has a facility in eddie brock's west coast in los angeles with some established interest in venom and also considering that michael keaton vulture shows up later in the mid credit scenes with wings that operate completely differently than the vulture rings from Spider-Man Homecoming designed by the Tinkerer, this Daily Bugle newspaper could actually end up being one of the most important Easter eggs in this movie that could help us make sense of how a wingless Adrian manages to take flight so damn fast despite not bringing his vulture suit with him. Because as we see at the end of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Vulture's wings have already been made by Oscorp in Sony's universe. So Gustav Fears probably set that Vulture Man up for success after helping Tombs out of prison. You know, just paying his lawyer fees and all that. So basically what I'm trying to say here is, to me, Sony is for sure trying to set up an amazing Spider-Man 3 with Andrew Garfield fighting this new Sinister 16. Likely against a Morbius, Vulture, Aaron Taylor Johnson Craven, Amazing Spider-Man 2 Harry Osborn, Doc Ock, because we see the legs at the end of Amazing Spider-Man 2, and maybe even Jake Gyllenhaal's Mysterio. A Sinister 6 scenario that could actually be fun with the right creative direction. Emphasis on the right creative direction. I will literally help you write this movie, Sony. Just hit me up. But another potential Amazing Spider-Man Easter egg, when we first meet the adult version of Milo, expertly played by Matt Smith, who absolutely just carries this entire film. Matt Smith, the god himself, channeling his inner goofy 11th Doctor from Doctor Who. It's actually my favorite show of all time. Let's, let's just be real. Though, yes, Milo could easily be referring to any sketchy Russian mobsters in the world that he pissed off during some friendly gambling while 
while explaining his heightened security to Morbius, this could also be an allusion towards the Russian Rhino from the Amazing Spider-Man 2's game, as a Rhino Easter egg can be seen next to a picture of a New York street on a Daily Bugle newspaper later on in the movie, with that street picture possibly alluding to that last street fight between Spider-Man and Rhino at the end of Amazing Spider-Man 2. And that Rhino Easter egg is next to another Easter egg alluding towards the existence of Black Cat in this universe as well, with the words Black Cat, Friend, or Foe, who could also end up factoring into an Amazing Spider-Man 3 scenario if Sony is actually going down that road. I mean, Sydney Sweeney did just join the cast of Madam Web after all, and a lot of people are hoping that she is playing Felicia Hardy. So maybe Sony's just setting up the seeds for her right here. And I love, absolutely love the repeated Doctor Who Easter egg throughout this movie, as we can see the clock striking 11 when we first meet the former 11th Doctor, Matt Smith in Morbius. With the clock approaching 11 earlier in the film as a young Milo first approaches to meet a young Morbius in Greece. And later on in the film, when Milo is asked to describe his pain from 1 to 10, Matt Smith says 11. And my god, should he have winked at the camera when he did that because my Doctor Who loving ass would have ate that shit right up. And when Morbius finally gets the funding that he needs to conduct his illegal experiments on the high seeds aboard the ship called the Murnau, which is of course named after F.W. Murnau, the first director of 1922's vampire classic Nosferatu, we are set up with very similar circumstances of Morbius's origin that we find in the pages of Amazing Spider-Man 102, with Morbius and Martin on a boat while Morbius infuses bat DNA into his body, leading to a transformation that ends with Morbius experiencing his first taste of blood. And director Daniel Espinosa's love for the Matrix movies is very much apparent with not just Morbius's brutal bullet time bludgeoning of his first victims, but also through the movie's overall theme of red versus blue, with the movie's main character having to make this choice of red versus blue, much like Neo does in the Matrix. But in this situation, the blue pill of artificial blue blood is the way to go for Morbius rather than than the enticing red human blood. And he even goes as far to include a bullet timey matrix fight in a subway between Morbius and Milo later on in the movie that ends with one of them jumping in front of a moving train, much like the Neo and Agent Smith fight from the first Matrix film. In a detail that I found really interesting while all of these assault rifle sailors were being assailed by some asshole is the visual and sound design of this particular shot here of Morbius slashing this poor brother's throat with the sounds of blood spurting being clearly audible. However, because this movie is PG-13, no blood is actually animated in post to actually come out of this dude's neck to, you know, actually make that sound. So it literally just looks like this dude is just, you know, choking on a Fig Newton or some shit. Especially since Morbius's neck slash clearly doesn't even touch his neck. Smart move though, because he definitely bought himself a few more minutes before Morbius inevitably drains all eight men of all of their blood, apparently. As mentioned by Agent Rodriguez a little bit later in the film. And while Morbius tests out his new vampire powers at his facilities at Horizon Labs, a famous laboratory from the Marvel comics filled with cutting edge innovations that comic book Morbius has links to, we see Morbius's echolocation manifested through the use of vibrant color. And while this isn't to the same degree as, you know, your average living vampire, there are actually people in the world that can see sound and music as color through a phenomenon called chromesthesia, which is something that the singer Lord has said has contributed to the creation of her music, especially the song Greenlight. And of course, for the second time this week, we got a nice high anxiety light flickering hallway scene before this nice nurse lady is murdered by Milo, with Moon Knight episode one also tapping to the common horror trope. You know, like we see played out in 2016 teens lights out for example And when Morbius is arrested for Milo's murder, he has a one-on-one -on -one with Agent Shroud and Rodriguez with the triple blessed holy water, because you gotta have it if you're facing a vampire one-on-one. -on -one. And when he does, Morbius makes a direct reference to the 2008 Incredible Hulk film by warning the two that they wouldn't like him when he's hungry. Same problem. That's your mic. I, now me they should conform me. Now I'm bang Juan Doyle, for me. And while a jailbroken Morbius and Milo get into that tussle in the subway, Morbius walks past a poster with the word Basilisk on it. A nod to the Morbius enemy Basilisk, a man turned monster who debuted in the pages of Morbius number no. 5 in the 90s, possibly teasing a potential villain for a Morbius sequel. And finally, the final fight of Morbius ends with Morbius calling out to a swarm of bats for bat backup, Batman Begins style, and introduces this power to control bats, alluded to earlier in the film when he hops into his bat tank set to a score suspiciously similar to that of Hans Zimmer's Batman score.
When I heard that in the theater, I was like, hold on, hold on. And of course, the movie ends with Morbius stabbing his best friend Milo in the heart in traditional vampire killing fashion, despite telling his girlfriend only minutes ago that they weren't that kind of vampires. But hey, whatever. <laughs> But that is it for this breakdown of Morbius. What do you guys think of the movie? And what did you guys think of the post credit scene? Let us know in the comment section below, my beautiful nerd babies. But anyways, you can follow me at MasterTainment on Twitter if you want to see me tweet some weird shit. But most importantly, you can follow New Rockstars wherever we are on social media. And when you do on YouTube, make sure you hit that notification bell so you can get notifications every time we upload a video. And please make sure to hit up NewRockstarsMerch.com because we have amazing Moon Knight merch for Moon Knight season. We got new shirts. We got a new hoodie, which looks super fire. Eric was wearing it the other day. And it looks pretty, looks pretty good, I gotta say. So if you want to look fly like Eric Voss, head on over to NewRockstarsMerch.com. Thank you guys so much for watching this video and for spending time with me. I really appreciate it so much, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. <laughs>